Hello and welcome back. It's always a great pleasure to welcome our next guest back into the Splashy the Paint studio. So folks, let's sit back and enjoy part one of today's Try Your Hand at project with leading pastel artist Vic Baker. Hi, so today we're going to be painting a zebra in pastels on black velour. Uh, black velour is quite interesting actually uh, to create nice dramatic effects. We'll talk about that again in a few minutes. Uh, one of the things that uh, you might find useful when drawing or sketching anything on black paper is to prepare a sketch to trace down first. Otherwise, if we go straight onto there with a white pastel, we're likely to end up with a lot of white pastel all over the place, which is not hard to get rid of, but it's a bit of a pain. So I've prepared a, a sketch of our zebra from this photograph. Uh, the trace down is in the right position on the back. I'm just going to position it uh, where I want it to be, somewhere like that. Uh, what I've done is just made a couple of hinges of masking tape at the top so that I can lift it as I'm tracing through to make sure that it's coming through okay. Right, we have white trace down of course, not the graphite. And what I'm going to do is concentrate on mostly the white stripes. So I'm not going to draw or trace through the, the black stripes, just go around the edges of them. I've got a soft pencil for this, it's an 8B pencil. Uh, if you use anything that's too hard, on velour paper, like a 2B pencil or an HB or something like that, you'll more likely scratch the paper uh, and the marks are hard to get rid of. So use a soft pencil. You don't need to press very hard for this either. What you will find is that uh, if you rest your fingers on the paper too much, you're likely to get uh, fingerprints and thumbprints and all sorts on it. Don't worry about that. They rub off quite easily. What I'll do is uh, just go around the edge of the zebra's mane as well so I can see where that is. I don't want to fuss with too many details at this stage because the details will come later. All I'm interested in is getting everything in the right place, particularly the white areas. Now, a lot of people think that uh, a zebra is, in fact, a white horse with black stripes. I think it's been scientifically proved that it's the other way around, actually. It is, in fact, a black horse with white stripes. So it's the white stripes that we're concentrating on. And the line down for the neck and then continue just sketching around those black stripes. The reason I've shaded them in in the sketch is to save a little bit of confusion. Whenever you're painting anything with stripes or spots it's very very easy to get yourself confused. Seeing stripes before the eyes is probably worse than seeing spots before the eyes actually. So I'm going to do this little bit here then I'm going to lift the paper to make sure we've got everything coming through. So to lift it gently yeah, everything's coming through nice and soft, not too bright. I don't want it too bright. Now, as I come down further down the, uh, the horse's face, I'm going to hold the paper in place because if it moves, if it slides to one side or the other, then you're going to end up with something that looks quite, uh, st quite strange. It'll be a zebra of sorts, but uh, not, maybe not the one you were hoping for. Be methodical as well. So work from top to bottom, side to side, make sure you've got everything covered. And as I say, you can keep lifting the paper just to check. But it's a very easy process once you've got it sketched out. You can, of course, if you're not um, particularly skillful at freehand sketching, you can enlarge the photograph uh, or photocopy it to the size you want and then use the trace down. It's particularly useful for uh, black paper, for black velour. And black velour, as I started to say earlier on, gives you a much different effect than painting it on grey paper or something like that. The photograph itself um, is quite boring in a sense. It's got everything we need there, but the, the green background, because it's uh, from a zoo, the green background isn't really appropriate. And if you want something with a little bit more drama, a little bit more atmosphere, then do try the black because you can get really interesting results. Strong highlights, for example, and make it even more dramatic than the photograph that you have. So just get the line of his neck. Notice that, again, this is very sketchy to start with. And never think about fine details earlier on. That always comes later on. Just. Uh, outline around the eye. Now I need to check here, make sure that I'm in the right place. Yep. As I said, it's very easy to get lost. 
I'm going to make it a little bit sharper around the face and the nose, because that's a particularly important area, of course. And carry on outlining the stripes. And the outside of his nose, around the nostril, the mouth and lip area, and then the final few stripes around here. A little bit more careful. Now when you get the, uh, the stripes the right shape, and this is the same for a zebra or a tiger, then you've got the anatomy of the animal. So it's important just to make sure that the, the curves of the stripes are following the contours of the face and or the body. Let's have a little look. Okay, that's fine. So I'll just take this off. And then what we have is our initial working sketch using the, the, the prepared sketch and the trace down paper. Notice we have fingerprints and all sorts over here, but it does rub off the black very easily. So before we go in, tidy the sketch up with uh, a tonal sketch using the white in a moment or two, then we'll just get rid of those surplus marks. One of the most important pastels you can have in your kit when working on black is a black pastel. Of course, the black will tidy up any, any messes that you have left over from the white, for example. Okay, so stage two will be our tonal sketch. Normally, uh, on a grey paper or sandpaper, the tonal sketch will be in black, possibly, or brown or something like that. But because it's black, we need something a bit more visible. So we're going to use the hard white pastel to, just to sketch in or over sketch slightly more detailed our initial transfer. And at this point, also just pop in the white bits, the white stripes. Now here I just need to think about it for a moment, of course, uh, yeah, it's very easy to get confused. There we are. I know that's a white stripe, I can just work it out from this shape here. So fill in the ones that you know to be white at this stage, very, very loosely. It's still only a sketch, and then we'll know from the adjoining ones, which are the black stripes. So uh, that's a white one, definitely. Okay. He says with confidence. Yep. Okay. You can see, you can imagine how easy it would be to get uh, confused with these stripes. And it comes down here and around there. And it's moments like this when you start bringing this sigh of relief because you, you know you've got those stripes in the right place. Be careful not to rub this too much with your other hand as you're sketching in, otherwise you'll lift off some of that trace down and you won't be able to see where you were. Okay. Let me just do the ear. That was, that's going to help me as well because the ear is predominantly white. Sketch that in. Then come around the face. And around the ear there. And then the white stripes obviously continue with the same pattern up into the mane. So just draw the pastel upwards to suggest the, the hairs in the mane. And we'll have it fading out down here, I think. A little bit more around the chest. So to stand back, use your squint. Squint at it to check that everything's in the right place. If you're working on a painting uh, for a long period of time, you will find, if you're not careful, that uh, you maybe made a little mistake somewhere and it's hard to see when you're working on it close up. So always advise standing back if you're working on an easel, squint at it, make sure it looks okay from a, a, a little bit of a distance and then carry on. So a little bit of white above the eye, the eyelid. And down here, 
even if you do make a little bit of mistake at this point with the white pastel, remember you have the black pastel in your kit, so you can always make corrections if you need to. So a little bit of white underneath the eye there. And then we have to work out where these stripes are. So let me work from the bottom. There's a white bit around the nostril, a little bit of white under there. And then fingers crossed when we've done, these will join up nicely. Once we have the white stripes in place, then we have basically our zebra in front of us. Zebra or zebra? I tend to use both. I don't think there's any hard and fast rule on whether you pronounce it zebra or zebra. Whatever your preference is. Okay, we're almost there. Just a few more stripes down the nose here. Any that you've missed, you can pretty much work out quite easily down here. And just finish off with a little bit of white around there. Make sure the eye is in the right place. Make sure we have all the white stripes in the right place. And then we can call our tonal sketch finished, which is about there. OK, so when, once we're happy with our tonal sketch, remember the tonal sketch is, is white on black in this case, and then we'll add a little bit of color. Uh, this is stage three, and it's called blocking out. And really, all I want to do at this stage is to put some basic colors in the, uh, in the painting. Black and white, zebra, basically, but uh, by itself, just in black and white, it'll look a little bit dull. Uh, the coat, where it's black, will shine blues and purples and things like that. And of course, in the mane and around the ears and the eyes are our little bits of brown, too. So I've got two colors here to work with, both hard pastels. Hard pastels do work better on uh, black velour because it's a little bit softer than other velour papers. So what I'm going to do is use the brown uh, just to put in a little bit of colour using the side of the pastel around the top of the mane because the top of the mane is usually a reddish brown. And a good idea when you're blocking out colours, especially on black, is to make it a little bit stronger than you imagine you need. So it always uh, absorbs quite a lot of colour. It's almost like the black hole of painting papers or drawing papers. It really does absorb lots and lots of colour. So always put the colour on a little bit stronger than you think you need. And then, as always, with pastels and velour, just rub it in. The rubbing will help to push the pastel into the paper, but what it also does is it keeps the edges nice and soft as well, so we don't have uh, anything that's too strong. Now I can see around the neck and around here there's little touches of brown. In the front of the neck, it's probably uh, a reflected light from the ground or something like that. So you can imagine if the zebras uh, on the plains in Africa, there might be this red-brown earth, and the light-coloured fur will pick up some of that uh, red-brown. And again, around the eyes, the eyes themselves will be they're quite dark, obviously. Uh, we can't see too much detail in the eye in the photograph, but we'll know that it is quite dark brown. OK, so we're just going to put a little bit more of the brown uh, around the neck here. Uh, once you start getting used to looking for colour in a, at a picture, you can see it almost everywhere. So don't be shy of putting the colour on in great big blocks. That's what blocking out is all about. And uh, the colours themselves may seem a little bit strange at first, but they will fade once you start putting the details in. This is why I say you really need to put a, a lot of colour, especially on black, as early as you can. So we'll have a little bit of brown down the nose there. Coming into the muzzle, I can see hints of brown. If it helps, you can squint at the, the photograph as well. Once you squint at a photograph, it, it loses all the detail and helps you to concentrate on seeing tonal values and colour that otherwise might be missed. So I think we're about there with our brown. So the only other colour we need now for the blocking out to be complete is this uh, touch of purple. I'm using purple. Uh, you could use blue if you want to, but blue is quite cool. Purple or violet is a great colour uh, to balance with the browns to give you um, shadows. So where the browns might be our warm highlights, then the purple will be our cool shadows. So I'm going to have a look around the neck to start with, where the neck goes into shadow, over the black, over the white, over everything, and we'll pop a little bit of the purple as well. And again, be bold with it. 
really put the colour down. You won't see it anywhere near as intense as that when we finished, so don't be afraid of it. Put a little bit of purple around the front of the nose, the bridge of the nose if you like, and then a little bit around the muzzle here. So I can see little bits of blue in the photograph. So now I'm going to put use purple for that. Now one of the things when you're working from photographs, of course, and you print them out on your printer at home, like this one was done, then the, the tones and the colours are always a little bit unreal. So have in mind, if you've seen the animal in the zoo or something like that, have in mind the true colours that you saw, or indeed you know, the colours that appear on your laptop, which obviously will be a little bit truer than the colours printed out. So that's about it, I think. We've got some nice browns and purples in there. We have our white sketch underneath. So that's the end of that stage. Join me later in the programme and we'll finish the zebra. Great techniques there, Vic. We'll look forward to seeing part two later in today's programme. Now it's time for us to go out and about with leading acrylic artist Fraser Scarf and discover more fascinating insights into the inspiration behind some of his favourite works of art. Today is the turn of one of the most popular artists of the 19th century, who influenced the whole world of art. Let's join Fraser as he journeys into Tate Britain and takes a closer look at the wonderful world of James Abbott McNeil Whistler. Hello, I'm Fraser Scarf, and I'm here at London's Tate Britain today looking at some of the greatest works of British art from the past thousand years. I'll be talking a bit about why these works have inspired me over the course of my career. So I'm now in front of a painting by Whistler, uh, Symphony in White Number no. 2, The Little White Girl. And in the midpoint of Whistler's career, he starts naming his paintings symphonies and nocturnes, and he's part of something called the aesthetic movement. And what Whistler is trying to do is make arrangements on the canvas um, that work rather than putting too much emphasis on the narrative or subtext of the picture. So in this case, we're looking at Whistler using the arrangements of colours and shapes on a canvas in order to tell us something about the world. And he does this a lot throughout his career and his paintings become thinner and thinner as his career progresses. In this case we're looking at a painting of one of Whistler's mistresses and it's quite significant that in this picture she's actually wearing a wedding band which we haven't seen in any previous pictures of her by Whistler, perhaps signifying the change in their relationship. Now, Whistler's enormously interested in everything Japanese and he starts to include references to Japanese art, furniture and craft in his work throughout the latter part of his career. I've always been drawn to the face of the lady in this picture. She seems sort of quite dreamy um, staring into that mirror but perhaps the face painted as the reflection in the mirror seems slightly more troubled um, and inquisitive. So there we are. I hope you've uh, enjoyed this look at one of the masterpieces of British art as much as I have. Join us next time for more Out and About when we'll be looking further into some of the great works of British art. We'll be seeing more of Fraser in the weeks to come as he takes the role of curator, historian and educator as part of our regular Out and About feature. Now it's time for a quick break folks but join us soon when renowned oil artist Warren Seeley reveals a few of his favourite things and we showcase the works of up-and-coming SAA professional artist and tutor Julian Ash. See you soon. Mm -hmm.